What does it mean to be truly free? How does the American Revolution motivate our nation's greatest leaders to create a profound declaration of independence? Discover the brilliance, bravery, and battles our young men endured as Abigail Whitney takes you on a personal journey from revolution to declaration. Good day, my friends. I am Abigail Whitney. I am the wife of Samuel and the daughter of David and Lydia Cutler. And we live in the oldest part of Boston on Union Street. Samuel and I grew up together. Eventually we were married and we will have a large family for the colonial period. Samuel is a merchant by trade. He likes to create prints and sell prints that you could use for beddings and curtains. So I am busy raising a family and helping him out as best I can. Six of my children are gonna be born in our first home in Boston. Samuel, David, Benjamin, Anna, George, and James. Now we are the ordinary family that's living during an extraordinary time for America. We will move out to Concord, Massachusetts in 1768. That's a time when in the city there are a lot of riots and the markets have become very depressed. Our home is on the Bay Road and there Samuel will set up his shop next door and seven more children come along. I am blessed to have Abigail, Lydia, Sam Austin, Joseph, William, John, and Cyrus. Now that's the house that you'll hear about in a little bit where I am at on April 19th, 1775 when the American Revolution begins. Imagine how I must keep my 13 children safe the day the British soldiers come out to Concord. We'll come back to that in a moment. For now, I'm going to take you back to Boston as I'm with child one more time. And Sarah, Mary, Eben, and my last one, Henry, will come along. Now, I hope you take a look at the picture down here of my handsome son, the 17th child and his wife, Lucy Perkins. Lucy's sister, uh, Ruth, has married my Austin. So I have two daughter-in-laws from the same family. So that gives you a little idea about my family and where we are living. You know, in the 17th century, I am thinking of the charter from 1629. That was a time when Governor Winthrop here in America and the King of England decided that we had the right to govern ourselves. The charter was revoked and Samuel Adams during my lifetime works hard to reinstate the charter's uh, fundamental liberties. I want to share with you how much of a principle this is. You'll notice that I've brought the family account with me today. It's no less than 140 pages. And on page 22, of the family account, it says that we express a firm attachment to our gracious sovereign King George, but point out a manner in which the privileges under the charter have been violated, denying the right of Parliament to tax us without our consent and a determination to never tamely submit to any infringement of our liberties. For it to come to our family account, you can see that it is very important to many families as well as our political leader, such as Sam Adams. Other men that you may have heard of, like John Hancock and Paul Revere, Ben Franklin, the Sons of Liberties, will emerge to lead us into uh, restoring these fundamental liberties that were taken from us. What gives King George the right to tax us? Hmm, why are we being taxed on the sugar and the stamp, the paper goods? Why should I pay for that without representation over in Parliament? Ringing out the land are the famous words of James Otis. Taxation without representation is tyranny. This is a phrase that all generations to come will identify with. On the 5th of March, 1770, my nephew Samuel Austin will witness a horrific event in the middle of the Boston streets. 
It will go down in history as the Boston Massacre. On that day, five innocent young men lost their lives when the British soldiers opened fire in the middle of the streets. Well, this left a very painful and angry feeling in most of our hearts. Paul Revere will do an etching of that very incident and it will circulate around the colony as print propaganda. Three years later, there is a lot of effort to keep a peaceful protest as no one wanted another disaster that they had seen previously. And so on the 16th of December, 1773, the Sons of Liberty decide to take their action and uh, throw 342 crates of tea overboard from the ships, the Dartmouth, the Ellender, and the Beaver. This was a peaceful protest against the monopoly tea trade that was happening by the East India Company. And in this new land, there is no place for a, a monopoly trade. You might say this act teed off King George. He will close the ports of Boston. Husbands like mine will go ahead and sign what's called non-consumption agreements. The one for Concord has 300 signatures, my husband, three women, and the rest of the townsmen to declare we will not use imported goods. So these activities are the fundamental basis for why we will eventually lead to an American Revolution. Two years after the Tea Party with the ports closed, Sam Adams and John Hancock will meet in Concord. They can no longer talk about freeing the country in Boston, so they must do so uh, out in the countryside, and they choose our town of Concord. My husband will attend the meetings. He is muster master for the Concord militia. And so they will raise an army. Now I've brought some items today that reflect that. Let me show you what is called a leather cartridge case. This is a particular piece that every militia soldier, as a matter of fact, every English regiment will have as well. Made from leather, has on the strap a little brush and a pick to clean the end of the musket. Then inside, wooden chambers with paper cartridges. Women like myself are helping to stockpile thousands of these in case things come to war. Simply put, when you see the militiamen with these, they will take a cartridge out, bite it off, pour the gunpowder down their barrel of the musket, and then they're ready to prime load and follow the commands of their officer to shoot. So this will be carried with my husband as well as other men. On the eve of April the 19th, 1775, in Boston, British soldiers were on Boston's Common and they had been drilling and all of a sudden they started to load their rowboats. Word gets to Paul Revere and uh, he knows that they're going to come out to Concord. It is very true that we have supplies that we are hiding in our little country town of 1800. I happen to have 82 barrels of flour at my house in case we need to feed an army. And my neighbors are also hiding supplies. It is the real deal. General Gage will issue orders that they sh his army shall march to Concord to seize and destroy the artillery and arms. And then the spy letter from the French says to search particularly Mr. Whitney's house, who lives at the right-hand entrance as you come into town. Well, you might call it the map quest of the 18th century because that is exactly where I live and that my house is the only house to have direct orders to have a search. So you can see that we are a little anxious, but we will stand our ground. About five o'clock that afternoon, uh, Dr. Joseph Warren will dispatch, uh, will dispatch William Dawes and he will take what we call the Boston Neck in the southern route to notify the towns below Boston that the British are on the march. It's not every day a militia comes marching out of town from the city into the countryside. It is a sight indeed. So Paul Revere will be dispatched at about 10 o'clock by Dr. Joseph Warren. He is dear friends with Dr. Warren, as a matter of fact. And so he is safely rode over to Charlestown where he gets de 
uh, the best horse in the land, Deacon Larkin's Brown Beauty. And off like a shot he goes, the perfect jockey, if you will, and cries out, the regulars are out, the regulars are out. Remember, he has had two lanterns lit in Old North Church as the signal as the soldiers on the common will go over the Charles River, which is water. So Paul Revere is on his way. The regulars are out. The regulars are out. The regulars are out. His mission to go to Lexington to warn Hancock and Adams to get the move on and be safe. He continues on the way to Concord, but in fact is captured by British patrol. It is Sam Prescott who comes to our house at about half past two in the morning. My husband with the other men will rehide the supplies in the middle of the night. He has ordered me to stay home with the children. So I am anxiously, as you will, pacing back and forth as the wee hours of the morning carry on. Before dawn, there has been a fight in Lexington. Nowhere in the orders did it say for them to kill eight men. And that is what is coming my way into Concord. I look around and my son David is missing. He's about 14 years old and I am worried sick. The sun is starting to come up. The Lincoln men come by my house and ask me what I know on their way to Concord's North Bridge. Overnight, 400 militia have gathered at Mr. Buttrick's farm. Joseph Hosmer sees a plume of smoke coming from town and asks Colonel Barrett, are you going to let them burn down the town? And with that, they begin their march down to the bridge to meet the British soldiers. Remember, my husband is there. He is muster master drilling the soldiers. And so you might say later on, he's going to be a son of the American Revolution, just like Sam Adams. Well, shot goes off. We really do not know whose musket it came from. And the command from Major Buttrick is, fire, fellow soldiers, by God's sakes, fire. This being the shot heard around the world. Two men will be killed, Isaac Davis and Luther Blanchard. Three British soldiers, all from the 4th Regiment, two buried at Concord's North Bridge and one on the way to town. My husband hurries over the hill the back way. It says, Abigail, quick, hold the young children in the high-wheeled chaise. They will search the house as the orders said so. So I'm off to Bedford, Massachusetts, which is just the town over, with the young children and a bullet goes over through the head of Sam Austin. Whoosh, like that. So I'm losing David and Sam Austin is nearly hit in the line of fire. All of a sudden the countryside is quiet again and I figure it's okay to get back home. Well wouldn't you know my son David is there and he says mother I did not know there was such danger until I saw the whistling of the bullets and I kept out of father's sight being at the same side of the bridge as the British. Do you realize my 14-year-old saw one of the first men die in America's revolution? Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. What would it be like if your son saw the first casualty? And so the day wears on. You could tell the British had been there, and our items had been moved about and so on. But we are lucky that they did not disturb our goods, uh, but they will have open fire later on. I think they're coming back the next day when, in fact, they will come back. Weeks later, we will have a fight in Bunker Hill where my husband is, in fact, attending on the 17th of June, 1775. We lost 600 Americans to just short of 300 British soldiers that day. So the revolution continues from Fort Ticonderoga down through the uh, Atlantic the Eastern Seaboard and the last battle, Yorktown, 1781, with the Treaty of Paris signed in 1783. All along the way, we decide we will make a formal declaration of our independence, which is a very profound statement to declare our independence. So, you know, it starts out as when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. Think about that. We are declaring our independence from England. 
And it goes on and finally concludes that we are independent states and free and have full power to level war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. We are declaring ourselves independent. Now let's take a look at some of the Massachusetts signers. And we have five representatives from Massachusetts who are sitting in on the meetings for the Declaration of Independence. On June 11, 1776, five individuals were asked to partake in drafting the Declaration. It will go and undergo 86 changes. Here we have our own John Adams from Massachusetts. And this is Roger Sherman from Connecticut. Then we have Robert Livingston from New York. And I hope you understand that is Thomas Jefferson. And then we have Ben Franklin with John Hancock leading and Thomas, uh, uh, Charles Thompson looking on. Here, very serious looking is Sam Adams. This is a very important day for him. And then over here, we have Robert Treat Payne and Elbridge Jerry. Ever hear of Jerry Mandarin? Elbridge Jerry is the one to discover that. And so he has uh, figured a way to rearrange the districts in his favor for a vote, gerrymandering. So five representatives from Massachusetts in all for the declaration. Now, John Hancock is the one to sign on the 4th of July, 1776. And then our representatives from Massachusetts sign over in this corner. And the rest of the gentlemen you see around, they all sign in August except the representative from New Jersey. So this little declaration is in fact one of the most important documents in our country's history. And you are looking at some of my favorite patriots who have worked so hard to declare America's independence from England. It has been a pleasure to share with you some of the highlights today of some of my dear friends and patriots, how exciting it is to live during my lifetime. And we must think of how grateful we are for all our patriots here and in our hearts. And we can God bless America. Now I have some more housework to tend to. So thank you for enjoying a little moment with me today. Isabella Stewart Gardner, novelist Henry James once said that our guest, quote, is not a woman, she is a locomotive with a Pullman car attached, end quote. A New York Society magazine described her as, quote, the brightest, breeziest woman in Boston, end quote, and also said she is, quote, the idol of men and the envy of women, end quote. Let us welcome Isabella Stewart Gardner, founder of Boston's Fenway Courthouse Museum, which she had designed and built to showcase her extensive collection of Renaissance and Rococo art. Oh, it's you. For a moment, I thought you were Harry. My dear friend, Harry Sleeper, who came to fetch me this morning at the planned for hour of nine o'clock. We sh had a cup of tea and exchanged gossip and current events, as well as the fluctuations of financial markets. Then we finalized our plans when I shall be his house guest for a fortnight at his abode, Little Beauport in Gloucester, on Boston's North Shore. Now Harry has graciously said that I could help him plan 
an end of summer soiree. We shall have a special dinner. Each invite our guests. Now, my guests will include John Singer Sargent, the portraitist, who has recently returned from painting landscapes of the American West. Another guest, Mr. Okakura Kokuzo, Japanese poet and philosopher, who has been advising me on arranging my artifacts in the Asian room. Mr. Kokuzo is also advising the Museum of Fine Arts on their East Asia collection. Another guest, my friend and neighbor, Frederick Law Olmsted, who is cultivating his legacy with the emerald necklace in Boston. She'll be accompanied by his lovely wife, Margaret. Also, my middle nephew, Amory Gardner, has promised that he will attend. He has been so preoccupied with his responsibilities as headmaster at Groton Academy, where he also teaches Greek. Then, after we finish dinner, the guests will adjourn to Harry's patio where we shall read Tennyson aloud, overlooking Gloucester Harbor under the August full moon. And then, the next day, since Harry is ensconced with his plans for organizing the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, or SPINEA, the acronym, he has also enlisted the help of his colleague, William Appleton, who, well, the two men, I give them great credit for organizing historic preservation in our region. Both of their homes will be on the roster. Whereas I have maintained my house museum, Fenway Court, to be independent. That is why I am eagerly returning home to put the finishing touches on renovations. Now that Fenway Court has been open the past seven years, I have felt it's necessary. For the grand opening, New Year's Day, 1903, such a splendid, evening was planned. I had chosen members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra to play 45 minutes sharp. And then the court doors and arch windows opened with a scene that was indeed strange in midwinter Boston. There were lanterns and lit candles Throughout the courtyard, there was the fragrance of fresh blooms that wafted through the air in midwinter Boston. And both the sarcophagus and Arabian fountain had gentle trickling of water. Of course, some guests declared that they either had a headache or had a previous engagement and left promptly after the concert. But for those who stayed, we sipped champagne and nibbled on tiny donuts, two of my favorite foods, and had a perfectly delightful time. When my guests were about to depart, I stood on top of the double-sided jade staircase as each single file ascended. I shook their hand and then they left Fenway Court. 
this truly began a new chapter in my life. Within three months, I met Harry and his circle of friends up in Gloucester at the high tide mark of Eastern Point Boulevard. Now, with these renovations, I have been engaged starting over the winter. Um, I did a foreshortening of the music room, so it is only located on the second level. This has created the Spanish cloister on the first. At the far end is the alcove, in which I have just obtained a very early work by Mr. Sargent. Actually, this work that I have just obtained, I like almost as much as the portrait that Mr. Sargent did of me more than a quarter of a century ago. You see, after I had procured Van Gogh's self-portrait, I was inspired to have my own done. It's just that I wanted the right person to do it. So when Mr. Sargent was stateside, settling his parents' estate in Cambridge and taking commissions for his first American exhibition at the St. Batolf Club, I invited him to my then home at 150-152 Beacon Street that winter of 1887, where I sat and I sat. Oh, it was so difficult for me to be still during that time. I was so eager to see my likeness on canvas. Of course, this irritated Mr. Sargent. It was not until he had me standing while he stood at his easel and painted. We were in complete silence, in true accord. And when my portrait by Mr. Sargent was unveiled at the St. Batolf exhibition in the spring of 88. It did cause tongues to wag. Then when my poor dear husband heard the men at the club repeating gossip and vicious rumor that the men had heard from their wives during the ladies' tea party, my husband was so incensed that to protect my honor, he declared that Sargent's portrait of me was to be struck from the exhibition and never to be shown again during his lifetime. And so, to honor my dear husband's request, Mr. Sargent's portrait of me hangs in the Gothic room at Fenway Court, which is technically closed to the public until my demise. Oh, it is true that I opened the Gothic room for special occasions, mostly family gatherings for my birthday and the holidays. We have dinners, feasts at the long table. My house museum is open two weeks of every year. Two of the holiest weeks, the week of Easter, which often coincides with my birthday, and the week of Christmas. Now, I have checked the calendar for next year, and my birthday does fall on Easter week. So, we shall have one of the banquet gatherings also, I have made another change. It has occurred to me in the past six months that having free admission, well, people do not always appreciate what is free. 
So I have decided to charge $1 per person admission. I hope that you do not consider that to be too steep, but it has helped to keep the riffraff out. Now, the riffraff I refer to in part is some of those Simmons College students just across Palace Road. <laughs> not that I have any objection to female education. Oh, no, I am a rather staunch supporter. It's just that some of these students have taken tours of my house museum and, well, they were rather rude and did not have much polish. So, if any of you have been attempting to tour Fenway Court for more than three successive seasons, unsuccessfully, I do invite you to come, be my guest. We shall have tea in my residence on the fourth floor. My house museum is willed to the city of Boston for the education and enjoyment of the public forever. This reflects the motto that I designed in the shield inscribed, say mon plaisir, it is my pleasure. And all of Boston has reigned. Oh, Harry, there you are. I've been waiting ever so patiently. Let us adjourn to your museum. I bid you all a fond adieu. In 1809, James Madison became the fourth president of the United States. His wife, Dolly Madison, stepped competently into and established the role as First Lady at a time when our infant republic struggled to identify itself. Although she is best known for her hospitality, few people know of her influence in the intricately woven world of politics, government, and culture. Dolly became friends with and hostess to 12 past and future presidents. At a time when our young country endeavored to establish a foothold on the world stage, it faced British aggression, culminating in the War of 1812, and partisan political disagreements, often highly vitriolic and violent. Dolly Madison's response to these pressures, her self-sacrifice, compassion, and courage, garnered such admiration nationally that she became the only woman in American history whom Congress voted an honorary seat in both houses of Congress, this in a day when politics and government were strictly the domain of men. She became the most influential woman in the nation from the time of her husband's presidency until her death, and because of her contributions to this nation, should be considered a founding mother. At her death, the entire government and Washington City closed down to honor this remarkable woman. Dolly Madison herself was quoted as saying, quote, There is a secret in life better than a fortune teller can reveal. We all have a great hand in the forming of our own destiny, end quote. With passion, charm, and wit, Sally Mummy dispels the myth and fable that obscure Dolly Madison. In a first-person portrayal, Miss Mummy captures the essence of Dolly by using her own words and performs this living history in proper 19th century clothing. The year is 1837, and we join Dolly Madison in Washington City. Welcome to my home. How good of you to come. Tea is not quite ready, so we'll have time for a little uh, socializing. It's been 20 years since my husband, Mr. Madison, and I left Washington City, then 
a raw, struggling town with great ambitions. But now I can't believe how much it's changed. I hardly recognize it. So many new buildings, gracious. And that means I feel like such a relic of the past. I knew all the founding fathers, such brilliant minds, oh, some irascible characters, and <laughs> they've all passed. And I'm the last living connection to them. Oh, the stories I can tell, it would curl your hair. Since uh, returning, I've received a flood of invitations. <laughs> One arrived just this morning, and the messenger waited to, uh, for my answer. I have been invited to lay the cornerstone for the Washington Monument. Oh, what an honor. George Washington served our country with such distinction. Have you met him? Have you ever? Oh, well, such a magnificent man, tall in stature, impeccable manners, and such a wonderful dancer. I've never had better. He particularly loved dancing with uh, pretty ladies. <laughs> but did you know that he was constantly in pain with all that he has accomplished, constantly in pain, and had to use laudanum quite frequently because of his teeth? It's true. He told me that he was sickly when he was young and he was repeatedly given mercury oxide and they believe that that's what caused him to lose his teeth. The poor man, he was 21 years old and had one tooth left. I've seen a pair of his uh, false teeth quite by accident. <laughs> I shouldn't have seen them, but um, <clears throat> they're either elephant or hippopotamus um, carved from that, and then tiny, tiny, little gold, <laughs> I can't tell you, <laughs> little gold springs, because when I looked at them, I, they were smiling at me, so I smiled. <laughs> wow. I was just 15 years of age when my father, John Payne, moved our family to Philadelphia, then the capital of this great nation. He did so to deepen his religious beliefs with the Society of Friends, but he sold the plantation, freed all of his slaves, and the difference in living in Philadelphia, the largest of our nation, oh, with cobblestone streets and so many brick buildings and the stores, oh, just to look in the shop windows, of course, being a Quaker, I dress very modestly and plainly. The great, uh, but I can still look and see what other vanities women are wearing, but the great uh, disadvantage of li li sorry, living in Philadelphia is being under the constant watch of the Quaker matrons. Apparently, the cut of my dress, the way I wear my cap, causes great offense, and the women are constantly trying to stamp me in their own image very pious, very plain. The Quakers believe in hard work, but when someone fails in business, to them it's a sign of a weak character. When my father's business failed, he was read out of the Pine Street meeting house. In total humiliation, father took to his bed, turned his head to the wall, and poor mother had to open our home to boarders just to survive. Well, we worked very hard to keep that boarding house uh, sparkling clean and cooking, and that's why it was such a shock to me when my father called me one day and said that he had made arrangements for me to marry. I was to marry uh, John Todd, an up-and-coming Quaker lawyer who had befriended him when all others had shunned him. Well, a simple thank you note would do. You don't have to give him your daughter to show that uh, you're grateful. Well, I thought about this for quite a while. I don't want to marry, leave our family. Well, but my father's wishes cannot be disobeyed. So reluctantly, I gave up my girlhood and married Mr. Todd. Oh, we fell deeply in love. And within a year, <laughs> our first son, was born. We named it after my father, Payne. 
Unfortunately, less than two years later, an epidemic of yellow fever spread through the city. My husband moved our family out of the city to a place of safety. I was so large with child, I had to be carried on a litter. He tended his, he went back to tend his parents, and um, unfortunately, they both died on the same day after he closed up their house. Oh, it was so wonderful. He came to me, and I heard his voice, and I went screaming and just threw my arms around him, thanking God for his safe return, and he suddenly pushed me hard. And I was like, John, what have I done? And he said, didn't you hear me say not to touch me? No. I have the fever in my veins, but I just had to see you one last time. Oh, I remember looking at my beloved's face, and the room started to swirl, and everything went black. It's the last time I saw my beloved. Our three-week-old son became very ill, as did I, and he soon joined his father. Part of me died with them, and the only comfort I have is knowing that our poor baby is not alone, but he's with his father for protection. The simple fact is that I returned to Philadelphia to our modest brick home with $19 in my pocket. <laughs> my husband's brother James came to visit, and instead of offering me the support that I needed, he came to discuss the estate of which my son and I are part of. Due to the act of coverture, when a woman marries, she becomes the property of the husband, as well as any children. And it also states that a woman cannot be the guardian of an underage child. We had some fight, and I hired a Philadelphia lawyer and fought for my son. We settled out of court, and I kept my son. The truth of the matter is, as a widow, I need a husband. And so I opened the door to various gentlemen callers, if you will. <laughs> there was a Mr. Savage who directed his entire conversation to my bosom, and I wanted to go like that. And then there was, well, a pig farmer who announced his presence without even opening the door. Uh, but there was also Mr. Madison, a slender, a small man dressed in the old style of clothes who was 17 years my senior. In the midst of me deciding my future, suddenly I received a note from Mrs. Washington who wanted to see me for tea. And when the servant left, she said, Dolly, is it true? I understand from a very reliable source that Mr. Madison has fallen head over heels in love with you, that confirmed bachelor. Who would have thought? Now, my husband and I certainly hardly agree. Tell me, are you engaged? My face must have been burning. Uh, just, it was so hot when I said no. He hadn't uh, proposed yet. I've always wondered the timing of this, if not, uh, if um, Mrs. Washington didn't have him for tea because less than a week later he proposed and said that he would only marry for love. Well, I didn't have that luxury. But he said that he was engaged to a young woman before who sent him a note. He broke off the, she broke off the engagement, sealing it with rye dose, a, a symbol that her feelings had soured. And that um, he had not paid any attention to my gender, except when he looked at me, he fell in love. And would I be his wife? He was trembling at the prospect. <laughs> For some reason, I just couldn't help but thinking of a small Mexican chihuahua dog. Mm. To my surprise, uh, we were married four months later. Of course, I was still in mourning for my husband and son, and son dead just these eight months. But as he is from a very, very wealthy Virginia family, very old stock, I knew that he would provide for my son and I. And 
as he was not a Quaker, I was read out of the Pine Street Meeting House, getting to be a family tradition. And of course, released from the restrictive dress and habits from the Quakers. Now I can dress in the latest fashions, and with my husband's blessings, I shop frequently. Thank you, Mr. Madison. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I got here as soon as I could. Seven years later, Thomas Jefferson was elected president and named my husband as Secretary of State. Now, the Capitol was in Washington City, and when we arrived in the year of our Lord, 1802, there was a raw slash of landscape. There was one major ruddy road, and just so muddy, and it was just awful. And there was the Capitol and the president's mansion on it aside from a scattering of residential homes, a, um, a church, and that was about it. There was really nothing to recommend it to visitors. Oh, there was a swamp, which excellent partridge shooting. One of the amazing things that my husband did was he negotiated the purchase for the Louisiana Territory. It's true. It's um, the original land grant, which I saw, granted land from England only to the Mississippi River. Now, France claims 828,000 square miles west of the Mississippi, and we're willing to sell it for $15 million. What a bargain. Huh. So, with that, of course, Napoleon was fighting just about everyone in Europe and needed the money. With that, we doubled the size of our country, removed the French from our doorstep, and opened land to westward expansion. Now, Thomas Jefferson had decided that he wanted um, Lewis and Clark to do an expedition just to map the country that we just bought, the land that we bought. And, well, um, Congress did not allocate enough money and when my husband told me that, I put a notice in the newspaper and started gathering money from private sources. Private citizens made up the shortfall of, fall of their tight-fisted Congress. Can you believe that? Mr. Lewis, one of our friends, uh, came and thanked me um, specifically. How kind of him. Hmm. After serving as Secretary of State for eight years, my husband was elected president. Now it was my turn to set to right things I thought needed to be done. I wanted to have my husband's term run as smoothly as possible. And <laughs> Ms. Charles Pinckney, who ran against my husband, said he was defeated by both Mr. and Mrs. Madison, and he might have had a better chance if he faced my husband alone. <laughs> Well, up until this time, presidents were content that the presidential mansion, uh, then private, uh, private residence, was um, impressive from the outside, but they left the inside desolate. It is my idea that the presidential mansion should be the center of political power, but also of cultural and social gatherings, that it should be decorated in an elegant manner, not just higgledy-piggledy with leftover furniture from Monticello, and open to the public. Congress uh, allocated some funds, and I spent every penny of it. <laughs> now it looks much better. I also set about ending the bitter struggles between the two parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Can you imagine that although we have a framework for our government, it is hardly functioning because of the bitter feelings. Each feels that the other is a traitor to our young country. There are fisticuffs, brawls, and challenges to duels on the floor of the Congress. Imagine, to his dying day, my father, actually, my husband, sorry, actually believed that um, this Republican experiment might actually fail. I started to entertain the political parties together. I also threw open the doors to the executive mansion every Wednesday evening 
inviting both parties and anyone else actually who was in town didn't want to stop by. I introduced them uh, to people who could be of mutual benefit and soon I found that the, um, my husband said that the government was running much better due to the mutual understanding of the two parties. I also saw that there was poor and needy in the city that um, needed to be taken care of. So I put a notice in the newspaper inviting all ladies who wanted to join me to come and help s establish some charities. That's how my favorite, the Washington Orphan Asylum, was established and many others. We give out food and clothing to those in need and medical supplies. I'm happy to say that um, the charities are still functioning. Oh, <laughs> I have to tell you, <laughs> We entertain a lot of foreign dignitaries, and this one, the Tunisian minister, came and presented me with a saber, saying that the Bedouin women of his country have dances balancing them, showing that they are carrying on the, um, <laughs> the honor of their husbands when they are not uh, there. <laughs> what a useful gift. Also, um, my husband faced the most difficult decision any president could face. In fact, it ended up costing thousands of lives. It's true. We had been trying to stay neutral between the French and the British, who have been fighting for years, but Britain wanted us to support them. Well, they started to put pressure and started to they kidnapped some of our American sailors and pressed them into their Navy to fi fight Napoleon, never to be seen again. Well, that didn't work. So then they started to haul our merchant vessels aside and loot them. On the 12th day of June, the year of our Lord, 1812, my husband declared war on the most powerful nation on the earth. What an outcry of people against my husband. Oh, gracious. They called it <laughs> Mr. Madison's War, and many refused to fight. But there was no way to defend our country, to say nothing of our honor from the British aggression, really. Well, initially, our tiny navy of 20 ships um, had spectacular success. The uh, U.S. Constitution made many conquests. In fact, they, it, re, it um, earned the, the sobriquet Old Ironsides because of the way the, uh, there was double oak in the sides of the ship. And also, Captain Decatur of the uh, U.S. Constitution he captured the frigate Macedonia and cut that flag and sent the captured British flag to Washington City, to Tomlinson's, where we were all gathered celebrating. Suddenly the ballroom doors opened and there marched the sailors carrying the captured British flag. They marched around the room, knelt and placed it at my feet. I will never forget that honor, that moment. The room was wild with cheers and the honor they bestowed upon me. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have a standing army. We have militia that we gather from the states. And really, the militia gather once a month or so and they all march around for a bit and then get drunk. Hmm. This is what we are fighting with uh, against Britain. Admiral, sorry, I can't talk of his, this. Oh, I am so mad. General Armstrong sent most of our militia to the Canadian border, believing that the enemy would fight from there. Our spies told us that there were 50 British ships chock-a-block full of fighting men heading our way. When they showed up off the coast of Virginia, most of our militia was north. And it was decided to 
make a stand to defend the capital uh, 10 miles away from the city at Bladensburg. It was a very hot and humid day like it is today when my husband left to join the army. I received periodic notes from him in pencil, the last one telling me to be ready to flee at a moment's notice because the enemy was quite strong. Well, I packed everything I could, including the Declaration of Independence and different cabinet papers in trunks and anything that was of value that I could fit into the trunks from the presidential mansion. Unfortunately, I could only pack a few of our clothes and a small clock and a few volumes of books because people had left in droves and there was not a wagon to be had for love nor money, so whatever I could fit in the trunks was what came with me. <laughs> now, I was supposed to stay at the Carroll's house that evening, and when suddenly there was a messenger that came th galloping through, the horse was a ladder, he was covered in dust and saying, clear out, clear out, General Armstrong has ordered a retreat, clear out. Dear God, Mr. Carroll had arrived to try and hasten me. The he told me that the enemy was already in the city. Make haste, madam, make haste. Well, he became very angry when I wouldn't leave until the painting of uh, George Washington was taken down. If he'd spent less time shouting and more time helping me, it would have been better. As we were leaving, of course, um, we saw our city was already burning, had the British march directly to the executive mansion, they would have captured me as they threatened to do. Instead, they first started at the Capitol and then Library of Congress and everything was torched. They arrived at the presidential mansion and ransacked it, took whatever they wanted as souvenirs and burnt everything else that I couldn't save. I didn't sleep that night. I stayed in my clothes. Um, I was afraid that I might still be captured. And I was so worried about my husband. The next day, the British continued their burning and all of a sudden a great storm came up and it lasted for two hours. Now, just before this, I was traveling to Wiley's Tavern where we had uh, agreed to meet, my husband and I, if we got separated. And I just got inside the door when suddenly the heavens broke loose. I was fortunate to get a room, and as I was walking up the stairs, the owner of the place said, Mrs. Madison, is that you? Well, you come down here, because my husband is out there fighting with yours, and damn it, you won't stay in my house. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning um, hit a tree nearby, and she changed her mind. <laughs> oh, thank heavens. <laughs> When my husband joined me that evening, um, we clung to each other. I was so grateful that he had survived. He had told me that he and just about all of his cabinet had just about been captured by the British. Thank God he was safe. Well, the British may have thought that they had whooped us. They didn't. In fact, what they did by burning our capital they united our country. Many didn't want to fight Mr. Madison's war, but to burn our capital, well, that's a different story. So when the British, as they went looting down the coast but couldn't take Fort McHenry or Baltimore, they stopped outside of New Orleans with the idea of attacking New Orleans, capturing it, and controlling the Mississippi. When they went up against <laughs> J Andrew Jackson and our fighting men, they were roundly whipped and the British sued for peace. The British treated us with respect. They never made a move against us. And basically, we won the Second War of Independence. And my husband was a hero. So here we've come full circle. This beautiful city represents our triumphant republic and all who have sacrificed for her, 
but heavens, I'm just chatting like a mad pie. You must be very parched by now. Please, let us go in for tea. It must be ready. And uh, I can't wait to hear your stories. Bon appétit. <laughs>